not lived a clean moral life. But when all is said and done, she found water at the well. I want to preach to you this morning a little while on well intentions. Well intentions. Chapter number 4, verse number 1. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, then we'll begin to read. Father, we thank you again. Lord, as we come before thee, we just bless you this morning for the opportunity to, to attend the house of the Lord. Lord, help us to worship you today. God, forgive me of my sins and my failures and my many shortcomings. God, as I stand behind this sacred desk, Father, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of Calvary. God, help us to say only those things that would be pleasing to thy sight. Help us to say nothing contrary to thy will. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, did I miss anything? I missed a verse, didn't I? Now, I did that, I did that intentionally. Now, had you not known that, that I'd missed that verse, had you been not been following along with me in Scripture, or you remembered that, that would still read where, where it's understandable, isn't it? But listen to me. The Holy Spirit of God, in His... In his uh, omniscience and his omnipotence knowing what was going to happen here he placed this verse number four in here for a very specific reason now he says he must needs go through Samaria now the Holy Spirit of God wants us to know that Christ had a reason for going to Samaria now sometimes the, the Bible tells us on over in the chapter here we may get to it or not. Sometimes the Jews would, would avoid going through Samaria because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And knowing that, then uh, on over in the Scripture, then we're here, Jesus said, I must needs. I'm not going to take another route to get, uh, to get to where I'm going, to get to Galilee from Judea. I'm going to go through Samaria. I must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because Jesus in His omniscience knew that there would be somebody waiting on him down there in Samaria. He knew that there was, was someone going to be there that needed him. Now friend, I don't know during my daily life, I don't know who may or who may not need the gospel. But if I'm willing, and Lord help me to be willing, that if, if I have opportunity to share the good news, God help me to do that. Sometimes opportunity presents itself, and sometimes I'll go for a while and opportunity doesn't present itself. But if God brings it my way, Lord, help me to be a faithful witness for Him. Now Christ said, I must needs. It's important. It's very important that I go through Samaria. So we read on, then cometh to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the period parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. We see here, Verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. Now Jesus as he, as he came to this well we see the well here is a, in those days was a, was a well of life. It was a point of life. It was a point of well being when there was water. Now many times over in that area it does not rain very much. And a good well is, is very important. Now, that's what they would do over in Israel. When I was over there, there was thousands and thousands and thousands of, of desert, acres of desert, just everywhere. It was dry. It rained just a little bit while we were over there, and we were told that this doesn't happen. It doesn't rain over here. And so, so uh, you know, uh, some reason it rained there a little bit while we were over there. But it's just vast desert, and wherever there was water is wherever there was life. And when they would, uh, the Israelis have went out into the middle of the desert and right in the middle of the most, most forsaken place that you can look at, they'll, they'll be springing up acres and acres of greenery because they dig a well to irrigate with and that soil so rich uh, that, they, that they can grow uh, a, lot of, a lot of food over there and that's, that's what they're doing. They're growing it in the desert. 
because of the water that they get out of the ground. It doesn't rain. So here's Jesus. He's going to a well, and Jacob's well was there, and that well was a source of life. It was a source of hope. It was a source of water to the everybody that come to that well. And I'll tell you here, friend, today that Jesus is the source of hope, the source of life, and the source of all goodness to all those that will come to him. So he found he was there and he was wearied from his journey. What does this tell me? This tells me that Jesus, though he was God, was very much man. And he being wearied with his journey, he came and he sat down on that well. He sat there to rest. He sat there to relax. What time of the day was it? It was about midday. It was in the heat of the day. Most people wouldn't be traveling that day, but Jesus must need to go through Samaria. And at that important time and place, God, God knew that His Son must be there at setting it that well. He was there for the opportunity that He knew would present itself. And after, as He sat there, because it was about the sixth hour, there, verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Give me to drink. And, of course, this woman of Samaria, she is taken aback because here's a Jewish man asking her <coughs> for water. <coughs> now, he had not been traveling alone. His disciples were with him. Yet it was important for Jesus to meet this woman of Samaria at the well personally. His disciples had gone on into town to buy meat, verse 8, for his disciples were going away into the city to buy meat. They had went on into uh, Sychar, they had went on in there to buy meat. And Jesus was there alone sitting at that well. And here come this woman of Samaria. Here she came and she wanted to, uh, she wanted to uh, find water there because nobody else would be there. We see, number one, that Christ intended, in his well intentions, he intended to go through Samaria. He went there. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he did do. He went to go there because this woman was going to meet him at the well. It was well intended. And we see here that as he, as he met this woman at the well, the woman intended came there intended to get water. That's what she was there for. Her well intentions were to go and get water. Now why would she go there for water? She needed it to cook her food. She needed it to quench her thirst. She needed it to wash her hands. And she went there because the only time of the day she could go there was when everybody else wouldn't be there. See, she was a woman of ill repute. She was a woman that, uh, you know, that had very loose morals, had very loose standards, and we'll find that on down in the Scripture. And, and other women shunned her. I'm going to tell you something today. Jesus did not shun her. Sometimes we look at the dregs of society, so we call them, and we fail to realize that they're sinners in need of a Savior. We fail to realize that they may be no telling what they are, no, no telling how mean they are, what they've been. They still need a Savior. They need what the woman of Samaria needed that day. And did Jesus say, well, you know, the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, and I, I'm, I'm just gonna, not going to deal with you. But this woman, with her well intentions, she intended to get water. Verse number 7. Again, there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. Verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. There we find it. Those days the Jews did not have uh, uh, dealings with those uh, interracially married Samaritans. And they were considered uh, someone that they didn't go near. The Pharisees, you know, they would have nothing to do with them. The Jewish folks, they thought, well, they're, they're not part of us and they're uh, unclean and we can't go around them. But Jesus said, I'm not, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm going to the well. I have well intentions to meet this woman of Samaria. Listen, I don't know where you were when you met Jesus. But maybe, you know, maybe you had no intentions of getting saved that day. Most people don't. But when you meet this Jesus, it'll change your life. When you met Jesus, it changed your life for all eternity. So we see here that she... Uh, 
presented to Jesus that they had no dealings with the Samaritans. Does the woman say unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with? Or verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest uh, the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep, from whence thou hast thou that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. The woman thought that he was talking about the natural water in the well. And of course people need that. You've got to have water to live. You can live several days without food, but you must have water in order to live. And that's why she thought, well, you, you can't get water out of the well, you don't have a bucket. You can't, you know, uh, you can't get that, so how do, you, how do you expect to get water out of this well? Well, she was thinking of something entirely different than what Christ was aiming at. He was telling her of the well of living water, the well of life. He was telling her of the well of salvation that springs up into everlasting life. My friend, today I'm glad one day I met Jesus. I didn't meet him at the well. I met him in a church. But the same thing was true uh, for me as was for her. I was needing water. I was needing something that would cure that thirst inside of me. And the only thing that would do that would be him. She had uh, no intention of meeting Jesus or anyone else at the well, but she met him there. Jesus had well intentions. She had no intention of meeting Jesus. Now, like back to the illustration I used about this man at work. He has no intentions of meeting Jesus. Now my heart's burning for that man. He's getting up in his years. He's not a young man. And he's got some health problems. But if God will convict him, then he can come to know the Lord. And Lord, help me that I would be a witness before Him. How many people do you know? Maybe they're wicked. Maybe they're mean. Maybe you think there's no hope for them. Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's just a friend that you've met before and they're wicked and mean and seems like they care nothing about God or the things of God. Seems like the last thing in their mind is something to the Lord. I'm sure that this Samaritan woman had no thought of going to the well and meeting Jesus. She'd heard of Him. She knew about him, but she had no intentions of going there and meeting him. But guess what? When she least expected him, Jesus showed up. My friend, how many people do you and I know that even though their life may seem to be empty and wasted, but you know what they need? They need what I've got. They need what you've got. They need the power of the Holy Spirit of God springing up in them. Friend, we let our, sometimes I, I let my light be hidden. Sometimes I hide my light, and I should not do that. But we're all guilty sometimes of not of, of listening to the, the devil instead of the, the Holy Spirit of God when it comes to letting our light so shine before me. So her intentions were not to meet Jesus because she was shunned by other people. She didn't want to meet anybody. Now there comes to my mind several people that I've met over my lifetime that just didn't want to be around anybody because they were, you know, said they were so mean and so wicked. But Jesus said, Whosoever shall come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Think back in your mind just a moment of who that might be in your life. Who that person might be in your life that you think there's no hope for them. Do you think the religious community of that day would look at her and would say to her, you know, don't come to my church. Don't show up at our church because you've got too many issues. You're too, you're too much of a sinner. Listen, you say, well, that would never happen. Not here. By the help of God, no, it wouldn't happen here because you folks know better. You understand that people need the Lord. But there's places where this woman and her ill repute would not be accepted in churches. Isn't that sad? What was the church here for? What did Jesus go there for? He, he went to present this woman with a message of salvation. 
what is the church here for? We're here to present folks with a message of salvation to whosoever would call upon it. What does a church become if it, if it ceases to be one that presents a message of salvation? What does it become? It becomes a social center. It becomes a pharisaical center where everybody says, we're better than everybody else and we don't want sinners to come to our church. Lord help us, friend, if they don't come, how are they ever going to hear the gospel? So we invite folks to come. Let me tell you something, church. You bring all the lost people here that you can bring. You bring the meanest, the baddest, the, the, the wickedest person you can to the house of God if you can get them here. And God helping us, we'll preach the gospel to them. And you know what? The Holy Spirit of God may convict them and they may come to know the Lord. I could probably ask you this morning, how many of you have testimonies in your life of how mean you were before you got saved? Now, I don't have that. I don't have that. <coughs> I was mean enough after I got saved for a little while. But before I got saved, I don't have that. I don't have that testimony because I got saved at a young age before, you know, before I had time to get out in the world. I'm grateful for that. But I'm sure certain here there's some of you here. <coughs> this morning that would say preacher I was mean before I got saved I was wicked I was ungodly but then I met Jesus now you tell me did that not make a difference in your life did it not make a difference in your life when the moment you got saved everything about you changed I see some people here this morning that when they got saved everything changed in their life Everything was different after they met the Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, when this woman of Samaria came with her well intentions to get water and go back to the life she was living, here's what happened. Jesus said in verse number 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well, of living, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto her, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. See, she's thinking about something entirely different. It hasn't dawned on her yet why Jesus is here. Sometimes people will get under conviction of the Spirit of God and they don't understand exactly what's going on. <clears throat> But when they really realize they're lost, then is the time that the Lord can woo them to Him. Nobody's ever got saved except they first got lost. You think this woman got up early that morning and said, well, I'm going to go about my business and then I'm going to meet this man at the well and I'm going to get saved today. Do you think that's what she thought? She had no intentions of that. But see, she didn't know she was going to meet Jesus. Hey, when I got saved, I didn't know I was going to meet Jesus that night at church. <coughs> I didn't know my brother was going to have a burden for me and ask me if I wanted to get right with the Lord. As a little eight-year-old boy, I sat in there, had nothing in. Had, I doubt that I had two dimes in my pocket. I doubt that I had a penny in my pocket. I had nothing that I could give the Lord. I sat there and I'd listen to the preacher. And I couldn't tell you to this day what the preacher preached, but I know something I knew that I wanted something that, was, that I needed. My brother gave me the answer. And then I got to the altar, hallelujah, and I found, amen, what it was that I needed in my heart. Jesus revealed himself to me, and I called out to him. And he saved me by his grace. Isn't that wonderful? A friend, when it happened to you, exactly the same thing happened. You came to know the Lord, and you knew that you needed him. And when you cried out to him, he fulfilled every desire of your heart as far as salvation goes. Now once you were lost, but now you're found. You were blind, but now you see. Why? Because you met Jesus. And this woman's intentions were not to do anything but to get water and go back to house. But Jesus, in, in down through verse 24, he intended, his well intentions were to tell her the truth. I'm just going to tell you the truth this morning. If you're here lost without God, the truth of the matter is you need this living water springing up in you. 
you're dry and thirsty. And you need what this little Samaritan woman got that day is exactly what you need. If you're lost without God, your only hope is to, is to be saved by the power of the Spirit of God. Your only hope is to come to know Him. See, you say, well, preacher, you don't know how mean I've been. It doesn't matter. Preacher, you don't know what kind of life I've lived. You don't know what kind of hypocrite I've been. You don't know anything about me. I don't, but I know one person that does, and that's Jesus Christ. And if he comes to you, the Bible says you must be born again. That's what he told Nicodemus. See, he just got through dealing with Nicodemus back in chapter number 3. And he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And now he's telling this Samaritan woman, you need this living water. He says, I'll give you living water. I'll give you water that will make you never thirst again. Not for, not for natural water, but for spiritual things. And if you're there lost without God, you don't have that. And listen, what will happen to you is you'll die and go to hell without God. You'll spend eternity in hell without Him, without hope. And friend, that's not a, that is nowhere that anybody living really wants to go. Nobody wants to go to hell. Nobody wants to spend eternity in the lake of fire with the devil. But that's where lost people go if they don't accept Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Him, friends, your only hope is to call upon Jesus, trust in Him. So Jesus tells her, verse number 15, let me read some more scripture. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said to her husband, Go call thy husband and come hither. Jesus said, I, I want you to go tell your husband. And Jesus knew what he was saying. He knew all about her. And she said to him, the, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly? He said, I have no husband. And now she was living, having had five husbands. And now she was shacked up with somebody else. You say, ah, that's, that's the dregs of society. No, I want to tell you something, friend. That's a sinner that needs salvation. Could this woman ever go back and do anything about her past? No. But could she from that day forward live and serve the Lord? Yes. Sometimes we as believers, we are too concerned with what is in people's past to encourage them to go on and do what they can do for the Lord today. Amen. And it doesn't matter if you've been the drunkest of drunks or whatever you might have been this morning. Let me encourage you, if you're saved by the grace of God, do what Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. And I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. Now, people's not going to forget your past. They shouldn't hold it, get your past against you. They should not throw your past up to you. But guess what? God forgets it. God forgets your past. He don't know that. He's put it in the, in the uh, depths of the sea. He's forgot your sins. But preacher, nobody's going to listen to me. Listen, you follow the Lord, and no matter what you've done or what you've been, God will use you for His glory. See, a lot of people carry a weight around about them because of what their past was that God can't use them today. God can use anybody that's, that's willing to be used to the Lord, no matter their past. Mistakes are made. I've made too many mistakes in my life. I've done too many things that are wrong. But that doesn't mean that I can't serve the Lord. That does not mean that I can't go on and preach the gospel. That means that I'm, I'm, I remember, but God don't because I've got them under the blood. But what did this woman do? She revealed herself. When Jesus had told her all things that she'd done, she said, you're right. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord... And, and, and right now the things are going through your mind that you've done, you're right, you've done them. You're guilty. But God in heaven will save you by His grace. If you're here, child of God, remembering right now things you've done in your past, listen, I'm guilty, you're guilty, but guess what? We need to get them under the blood and ask the Lord <coughs> to help us that we not live in the past 
but we live in, live for the future for Him. We, listen, we don't have long left here in this life. I, I understood the other day, I, I, got, I, I come to the truth of something. First time in my life I've really come to the truth of something. I'm getting older. Some of you grinning like you ain't got there yet. But everybody in here is getting older. I'm looked, I looked in the mirror and saw the gray hairs in my head and I thought, you're getting older. I saw my middle section getting bigger and I thought, you're getting older. I'm working on that. I can do something about that. I just love to eat too much. Now, you ladies don't ever get older, so I'm going to throw you all a plug, okay? You just get prettier. Amen. Now, you ladies ought to be amen to me now. Us men, we just are what we are. Amen. We just what we are. But I'll tell you something, we're all getting older. Time is not getting any longer for us. Time is getting shorter. What we must do, we must do quickly. Now, this woman, what happened again? The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith to her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, and ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. You throw religion out the door. You throw denomination out the door. When it comes to worship, those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's how men ought to worship. They ought to worship in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter where you're at. You can worship the Lord. It doesn't matter what, you know, what part of the world you're in. You can worship God. It doesn't matter where you're at around your house. You can worship the Lord. And the intent, I believe, of Scripture is to encourage us to worship the Lord. Not just at church, but wherever we're at to worship the Lord. And worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he, is, when he is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. I'm who you're looking for. Now the Jews did not accept Jesus as a whole. They did not accept him. But he presented himself and he looked at this Samaritan woman, to the Gentile woman, he said, you're looking at him. I am he. I'm the Messiah. I'm he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city. She went to do what? She went to back to be a testimony. Now when she saw Jesus, and Jesus revealed who he was, you know what she did? She believed him. Amen. By faith, she believed in him. When Jesus says, I that speak to thee am he, she believed and she accepted. And here come the disciples along with what the world Jesus was doing. They were on the outside. They hadn't heard this conversation. And they come along wondering what he was doing talking to her. <clears throat> but the woman was excited. Now you've got to read a little bit between the lines here. And between the lines here it says she left her water pot. She left everything that she had ever thought about doing that day and there was an important message on her heart and that's to go tell somebody else. She had well intentions to tell others. From that well she took away well intentions to tell others. She left her water pot. And I see this water pot as being the symbol of her old life. She left that old water pot and she said, I'm going back. I'm going to tell others. I'm going to go my way. And I'm going to go back to those in the city. And I'm going to tell them. Come, and she went to the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Is this not Tim? He's the one that told me all things that ever I did. He revealed all the things that I've ever been. This is the Christ. I believe in him. This is the Christ. 
Then they went out of the city and came unto him. She went, well intentions to go tell somebody else. She went with excitement. She went with enthusiasm. And she got somebody to come back and hear this same Jesus. Let me tell you something. If I got as that enthused as that woman did, I could probably bring somebody to church that's lost. Amen? If we got as enthused about our salvation as this woman at the well got about her salvation, you know, we'd probably get somebody else to come to church. Amen? That's right, buddy. Amen. But you say, preacher, I invite them and they don't come. Don't give up. You know, the most important thing about us and our salvation is that we're excited about being saved. Yeah, I'm saved. Don't hang your head when somebody asks you if you're a Christian. If you get an opportunity to tell somebody you're saved, tell them, you know what, I'm going to heaven when I leave this world. If somebody asks you what's good news, tell them, I'm going to heaven when I die. Now they'll look at you like you're a crackpot many times. They'll look at you like, well, you're one of them. Yeah, I am. Praise the Lord. I'm one of them. I believe. But we ought to be excited about what the Lord's done for us. Listen, what did she have to tell? Had she been a long-time scholar in the Scripture and she could go down through the book of Isaiah and she could tell about the coming Savior and all that, all she knew was the Messiah was coming. And you know what she did when she went away from there? She went back to those men. I don't know how many of them. She went back to them and said, Come see a man that told me all that I did. Come see a man that knows all about me. Come, I, she went to tell others what Jesus had done for her. That's all, that's all the message she had. Come see this man. You want to meet this man. This is exciting. Lord, if we could just get that excited about our salvation. If we could just get as excited as this woman at the well was of our salvation. Oh, friend, God help me. I've, I've done here preach myself under conviction. Lord, help me to be excited about my salvation, what Jesus has done for me. We live in the cares of this life, and I will tell you what, this, life, this world gets gets harder and harder to live in as a believer. You're, if you're around public at all, if you're around the public at all, you, you can see how, how mean and vile and how wicked and how people just don't care anymore about anything. And it makes it hard. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Lord, help me to be excited about what the Lord's done for me. All she did in verse number 29, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not through Christ? Her well intentions was go to tell others. And in verse 29, we see that she did exactly that. She told her story. She told her story and what happened. We're about through. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him and said, Master, eat. He said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? See, they didn't even understand. That was his disciples. That was his closest followers, and they didn't understand. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the field. For they are white already to harvest. And friend, I say to you today, lift up your eyes, look on the field. For they are white already to harvest. I tell you, friend, there's lost people all over this community. There's lost people every day I meet. All over this world, there's lost people, and the field is white and to harvest. Maybe the big harvest is over, but there's some gleanings out there to be done. A few get saved. Wonder, once in a while somebody gets saved by the grace of God. You say, was well, it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. For that person not to go to hell and spend eternity, one once in a while gets in, amen, it's, it's worth it. To send missionaries all over the world to spread the gospel, the good news, is it worth it? Yes. So, preacher, I can't go all over the world. No. But you and I, faithfully as we are, we can send others. We can help them go. So this woman went and told. They came out and many believed when she told her story. Now let me ask you something. Do you have well intentions? 
Do you have well intentions? I, I studied this and looked at this and read this and studied this last night and today, and there's just too much in there seemingly for me to be able to get out like I want to. But I'll tell you something, friend. We should have well intentions as believers. Do you have well intentions to tell the story? I've got well intentions. Lord, help me that I would tell that story. Do we have well intentions to spread the gospel? We find Jesus here as not only the Savior, but we find Him as a great missionary telling others. God, help me to tell others. I'm praying, I'm praying this year that God will give me a burden for souls. That God will help me to be like I used to be and have a real burden for lost people dying and going to hell. God, stir that up in me again, Lord. And church, I'll tell you something. If God will stir a burden within us for lost souls, we'll see results around this altar. Now, what I'd like to, for everybody to do this morning is bow your head just for a moment. And in the stillness of this moment, I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, reveal somebody to me that I might get a burden for them, that I might pray for them till they get right with the Lord. You ought to put somebody on your heart. You ought to put a co-worker. You ought to put a family member. You ought to put someone on your heart that's lost without God. I know there's a lot of sick people we need to pray for. I know there's backslidden Christians we need to pray for. But the truth of the matter is, if they're saved, they're going to heaven. There's people that are lost. They're not backslidden. They're lost. And they need Jesus. Say, Lord, please put one person on my heart. And I'll pray for everybody else. But God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray hard for that one person that they might come to know the Lord. God dealt with you about someone? Has the Lord put someone on your heart that you might pray for that they might come to know the Lord? If you have, won't you slip up your hand and say, Preacher, there's somebody I want to pray for. God bless you. 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 All over the church tonight, this morning, somebody's on your mind. Then I'll encourage you, commit your way. Commit your, commit your prayer time. Commit a lot of that just to pray, Lord, touch that friend. I don't know, some of you may have the same person on your mind. You don't have to reveal that to nobody, just yourself. Pray for that friend. Lord, save that friend. God, put them under conviction. And if you're around them, invite them to church. If you're around them and, you, and the Lord gives you opportunity to witness, witness to them. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that you love to see them get right with the Lord. But most importantly, pray the Holy Spirit of God will deal with them. Father, we thank you this morning, God, for this opportunity. God, the Lord, it seems like we've struggled a little bit to present this like we wanted to. But God, we know, Father, that you have a way with the Spirit of God, Lord, to dealing with our hearts. And Father, I pray for those that have raised their hands this morning. God, I pray that you touch them, Lord, and let them, let them not get away farther from that, Lord, that person that they're going to pray for. Lord, let us daily, God, be burdened for someone that's lost, in particular that we might win them to Jesus before it's too late. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now, God, as we go through the remainder of this day. Bless us on the night service. God, if there's someone here that don't know you, God, I don't know. There may be someone here this morning that's lost. If there is, Lord, I pray that you convict them with the Spirit of God that they might come to know you. We'll thank you in Jesus' name.